Let me ask you to open your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 5, fifth chapter of the book of Isaiah. You know, I can't answer for other ministers and pastors, but when I feel like God has given me a message and given me something to preach, when all, whenever possible, I like to try to get some confirmation somehow from somebody or something that I've heard from God. And uh, after I... Actually, God's been dealing with me about this particular message for a couple of weeks now. And while I was contemplating this week about sharing the message, uh, as I've said a couple of times before, I, I receive on Facebook the uh, Facebook posts of Franklin Graham. And uh, this week, I forget which day it was, but I was reading a post book, a post post book. A Facebook post uh, from Franklin Graham and he quoted Isaiah 520 and that's the one verse from Isaiah that God had dealt with me about and we're going to go from there into the New Testament but when I saw that I said thank you Lord thank you for confirmation because you know some messages that we as pastors preach we enjoy preaching we like to preach them this is not one of those I will not enjoy preaching this message, but it, I feel like it needs to be preached uh, or else God wouldn't, wouldn't put it on my heart to preach it. But look with me at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. And by the way, if you're, if you're a title taker and a note maker, uh, the title for the message that God's given me is simply, The World We Live In. The World We Live In. Have you ever thought about the world we live in right now? Well, let, let's look at the scripture, the world we live in. Look, look at Isaiah 5.20. The inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The world we live in. That's a pretty apt description right there of the world we live in right now, folks. Call evil good and good evil. You know, there are many different illustrations we could use to illustrate this, but I think the best illustration of all when it comes to this is the issue of abortion. How in the world can anybody call good the murdering of children? How in the world can that be called good? And yet at a point in time, nine unelected judges appointed by different presidents, confirmed by the Senate, decided in Roe versus Wade that it was all right to murder children in the mother's womb. I don't for the life of me see how five intelligent human beings could come to that conclusion. In a five to four vote, Roe versus Wade became law. You say, well, we're law-abiding citizens. According to the Bible, we're, we're to obey the law. Yes, we are. We're to obey the law until it contradicts the higher law of God. And God's law is, thou shalt not murder. And I don't care what excuses anybody gives, what their political philosophy is or anything else. I'm telling you on the authority of the Word of God, the taking of an innocent life is murder. Amen. And children are being murdered by the millions in their mother's womb. And one day God is going to make America give account for all of that innocent blood that's been shed. How much more innocent could you be than a little baby in his mother's womb? And I'm here to tell you, God is against the killing of innocence. If you don't believe it, just read the Bible. That's why I can't understand many things that's going on in our nation. It's so clear and plain in God's Word, but so many so-called educated, intelligent people have decided that it makes no difference whatsoever what God's Word says. But God's Word, folks, is eternal. The Bible says, Thy Word, O Lord, is settled forever in heaven. God's Word does not change. 
And when it comes to some of the new laws that have been made, everybody say, well, you know, we live in a different world now. Things are different than they were back then. Things have changed. We live in a changing society. We may live in a changing society, but let me tell you something that does not change is God's eternal word. And God's word still says, thou shalt not murder. But we see it every day. And they're flaunted. It's flaunted before our very eyes. Well, some people might say, well, Brother Mickey, you know, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament law. And we're New Testament Christians. We're enlightened now. We don't go by Old Testament law. We go by the New Testament teachings of Jesus Christ and the New Testament teaching of the disciples. All right, let's look in the New Testament and see what the New Testament says about the world we live in. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And you know, in many churches across the land today, you just mention Romans chapter 1 and people break out in hives because of the message of Romans chapter 1. Now we could read the whole chapter and it's all applicable, but we're going to begin for our cause this morning to begin in verse 21. Look, look in Romans chapter 1 verse 21. The world we live in, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. See, people now make their own God. And, and you, you, can, you can try to convince me all you want to, but in my own mind, I am firmly convinced that there is no such thing in reality as a true atheist. I believe everybody knows there's some kind of God. You might say, well, I know they, they, they don't believe in God. And you know, those same people say, well, I, I can't believe in a God you can't see. I can't have faith in something I can't see. And those same people jump on an airplane, never meet the pilot, and sometimes never see him, and put their lives in the hand of a pilot they've never seen. Say, well, I can't have faith in anything I can't see. That's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> you have faith in things you can't see every day. They, they, they knew God. They glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. There's the main problem, folks. Their foolish heart was darkened. Did you know darkness, blackness, darkness is always symbolic of sin in God's Word? They live in darkness. They live in sin. Sin has overtaken their lives. And they live in sin. And, and that, that's what they abide by. They abide by a sinful nature rather than turning to God. Their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 22. The world we live in, here it is. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Isn't it amazing what the so-called intellectual people come up with? Let's take, for instance, not long ago we were doing a funeral out the way somewhere around Rosebud or somewhere out there in one of those country cemeteries. And there was a, the man that did the, 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 the cemetery work had his young son with him. And his young son was probably 11, 12 years old. And uh, I just walked around out there a little bit, and I picked up a couple of rocks that obviously were seashells. And I went over and, and I held those in my hand, and I asked that young boy, I said, you know what that proves? And he said, what? And I said, that proves that the Bible's true. He said, what? I said, how did, they, how did these seashells get out here in the middle of central Texas? There's no ocean out here. How, how did these seashells get here? I said, the only explanation for it is Noah's flood. Because see, according to the Bible, during Noah's flood, the whole earth was covered with water. And I guarantee you, I took geology at Hardin Simmons University in Abilene, Texas. Even out there in dry West Texas, we went out and did a, a, a field trip out there. And there were my, uh, trilobites and seashells and everything out there in the middle of dry West Texas. Well, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know what?